Splatoon as a franchise has had an interesting start. It's so unlike any other shooter on the market, and got put on a dying console almost as a last ditch effort to breathe life into the machine. Despite its failure to compel the masses into buying the Wii U, however, Splatoon has made waves and managed to captivate millions in a way few new Nintendo IPs have since Pikmin back in 2001. There's definitely a reason for that. Whether you're new to the series, one of many who's played the sequel but not the original, or anything in between, I invite you to join me today as I take a deep dive into the success of Splatoon 1 and how Splatoon 2 improved on a winning formula. Splatoon opens with a quick character creation sequence letting you choose your inkling's gender, skin color, and eye color, immediately followed by a brief tutorial that covers basic gameplay mechanics. You aim, shoot, run, jump, throw bombs, swim in your own ink, slip through grates in squid form, and cover anything that's not your color. One of the first things you'll notice is the game's gyroscopic aiming system, a standout feature that gives you access to accuracy only rivaled by a mouse. This is the way I'll be playing the two games throughout the video, however, if you prefer you can completely disable gyro aiming in both games. The tutorial does a solid job of teaching the player the basics of the game, only neglecting to handle super jumping, which in game is accomplished by tapping one of your teammates on the Wii U gamepad's map, allowing you to quickly rejoin a fight. The main draw of Splatoon is in its online multiplayer, which is still active today. The big advertising focus, and the mode you're most likely to be familiar with, is Turf War. Turf War matches pit two teams of four against each other in a fight to cover as much of the ground as possible in your ink color within three minutes. It's not hard to see why the mode is as popular as it is. It's instantly understandable whether you're a fresh player, an experienced player, or an onlooker, and it tests the core fundamentals of the game in an elegant way. Getting kills, or splats as they're called, isn't the primary focus of the game. Splatting opponents still helps further your team's objectives by temporarily eliminating them from the field and making them pop in your color, but inexperienced players can still contribute merely by firing their weapon. While vast skill differences won't exactly go unnoticed, Turf War tends to be a level playing field that gives Splatoon's core gameplay loop an opportunity to shine. It's a game where actions beget opportunities. Every shot fired is a new piece of turf you can safely maneuver through, hide in, heal and refill your ink tank with, an opportunity to expand and shape the battlefield to your whim, and an opportunity to build charge for powerful special weapons that can turn the tide of battle. I've often heard Turf War matches described as mesmerizing, and I'd have to agree with that assessment. Between the bright, vibrant visual style of the game that expertly conveys information to both players and onlookers, it's no wonder the game was an instant hit. Splatoon isn't a case of all flash no substance, though. Multiple aspects of the game have given it depth to draw in the more hardcore scene, and its variety of weapons provides the best example of this. There are seven weapon classes in the original game. Shooters, blasters, rollers, brushes, chargers, sloshers, and splatlings. Shooters are your basic guns and run the gamut of long range, short range, high power, low power, and anything in between. Blasters are high-powered shooters that fire off an explosion that typically kills opponents on direct hit. Rollers are short to mid-range paint rollers that can be rolled across the ground to paint turf and crush opponents or flick to spread ink. Brushes are short-range roller variants that excel at creating trails of ink quickly and can shred opponents up close. Chargers are sniper rifles that instantly kill at a full charge and create long lines of ink. Sloshers are literal buckets that excel at taking on opponents above you and can spread ink over walls and other obstacles. Splatlings are gatling guns that charge up a volley of projectiles that tend to fight from long range. Every weapon class has quite a bit of variety in terms of range, power, and ink efficiency, leading to a variety of playstyles even within the same weapon class. To add on to this, each weapon is equipped with a sub-weapon and a special weapon to complete a set. Sub-weapons are thrown items, typically bombs, that tend to cost most of your ink tank and can assist with splatting opponents and covering turf. Splat bombs are basic bombs that tumble across the ground and explode when the timer runs out, damaging opponents close to the explosion. Suction bombs stick to wherever they're thrown and have a slightly larger explosion radius. 
burst bombs explode on impact and deal less damage than other bombs, but are very effective in combination with your main weapon, dealing with retreating opponents or a general traversal through the ground or up walls. Seekers target and chase opponents, leaving a trail of ink in their wake. Ink mines hide in your ink and detonate when enemies cover them or get too close. Disruptors cripple your opponent's movement speed and ink recovery, nearly rendering them helpless. Point sensors put a tracker on opponents caught in its range that reveals their location to your entire team for about 8 seconds, no matter where they try to hide. Splash walls create a barrier that blocks enemy fire and can completely block off certain parts of a map for a short amount of time. Sprinklers stick to things like suction bombs do and continuously cover the ground where they're thrown. Finally, squid beacons act as super jump points that allow you and your team to instantly jump back into the fray. Special weapons can be used by covering a certain amount of the ground. Once you've covered enough, your hair will light up, signaling to you, your teammates, and the enemy team that you have your special ready to go. These special weapons are devastating and can cause a skirmish to turn in your favor in an instant. Specials include Bomb Rush, letting you throw your sub-weapon infinitely for the duration, the Bubbler, creating a force field that makes you and close teammates invincible for about 5 seconds, the Echo Locator, instantly revealing all enemy positions and refilling your ink, the Ink Strike, which can be fired anywhere on the map covering significant turf, the Ink Zuka, which fires towers of ink in quick succession, the Killer Whale, which completely denies an area for a few seconds, and the Kraken, turning the user into an invincible Kraken that can jump into opponents to instantly kill them. I should mention right now that if the idea of specials that make you invincible bothers you, this is something Splatoon 2 fixes. With all these options, it's easy to see why the combination of main, sub, and special weapons brings about a lot of strategic possibilities. While you can't change a weapon's kit, each weapon has two or three sets that give you unique playstyles to work with. Some work better than others, but the system in place creates a lot of opportunities for both solo and team play, a system further enhanced by gear abilities. Your headgear, clothes, and shoes all provide bonuses to your stats, ranging from faster ink recovery, faster swimming speed, higher damage, quicker respawn times, and more. Main abilities are locked to particular pieces of gear, but as you level up, you randomly gain sub-abilities with slightly less potent effects to further customize your loadout. Gear isn't limited to the slots it starts out with, either. Like the look of the gear you can buy at the start of the game? You can add more slots to it and be on equal footing with the best gear in the game. If you spot a player in a match with gear you like, you can order that piece of gear for yourself. You're limited in some respects, certainly. You can only equip a certain range of gear that has the main ability you want, and all sub-abilities are rolled at random. But this still allows for a lot of creative freedom in terms of both functional and aesthetic loadouts. Put together, the gear and weapon systems provide a lot of freedom for players to experiment and find unique playstyles that fit their needs, as well as create the freedom to create loadouts that work better on particular stages. Speaking of stages, an oft-criticized feature of Splatoon is its stage rotation system. Each rotation lasts 4 hours, and during that time frame, only 2 stages are available per mode. While most people, especially in the West, tend to dislike this decision, I think its inclusion is welcome, as it accommodates niche playstyles that may work fantastically for a given set of stages, but don't work as well for the rest of the stages in the game. What I can't defend is how rotations are handled in-game. Each time you boot the game or maps rotate, you're brought in to watch the game's pop idol news hosts, Callie and Marie, tell you what the current stage rotation is. While it's a wonderful touch for flavor, it adds to the incredible personality of the game, it's a needless interruption for seasoned players and very quickly gets stale. Rotation grievances aside, the stages in Splatoon are generally very well designed. None of the stages feel too large, nor does it typically feel like any weapon class is overpowering on any particular map. The stages come in all shapes and sizes, ranging from the thin corridors of Port Mackerel, the tall buildings of Flounder Heights, the curved bowls of Black Belly Skate Park, and the two-layer design of Kelp Dome. All but one stage in the game follow a rotationally symmetrical design that doesn't give an advantage to either team, leading to most stages feeling balanced regardless of game mode. They aren't all perfect. A few examples are Bluefin Depot's two central pits that are difficult to get out of and provide a distinct advantage to players above the pit, 
support macros lanes which are too narrow and give chargers and splatlings almost complete control. And Salt Spray Rig is the only map with reflectional symmetry which gives an inherent advantage to players starting at the left side of the map since Inklings hold their weapons with their right hand, allowing players on the left side to conceal their body and peek from behind walls. Overall though, the stages in Splatoon offer a variety of playstyles and most of the selection of 16 available stages are fun to play. All of this makes for a great experience in Turf War, but the most interesting game modes in Splatoon lie in its ranked battle system. Ranked matches assess your skill on a grading scale going from C- all the way to S+, awarding you points for winning and taking away points for losing. Ranked matches don't go by Turf War rules, instead consisting of three unique game modes, Splat Zones, Tower Control, and Rainmaker. In Splat Zones, you play a more concise, King of the Hill type match where you compete to hold one or two zones longer than your opponents, accruing penalties for losing control of the zone. In Tower Control, you vie for control of a tower that travels on a predefined course towards the goal in your opponent's base, giving them opportunities to take the tower back and ride it towards your base. In Rainmaker, you rush to grab the Rainmaker, a powerful weapon that slows you down significantly but fires large tornadoes of ink when fully charged, and try to escort its carrier to the enemy's base. All three of these game modes last for 5 minutes each, but don't necessarily have to last that long. A match can be as quick as 30 seconds or go into overtime if the losing team is at an advantage state. These modes have significantly more strategic depth than standard turf war matches. Covering turf is useful, but there's a higher focus on eliminating players and controlling specific parts of the map than in turf war. You can also play with friends and tackle the current ranked rotation together. Although these days it seems to take longer to find a match this way. To many players, ranked is the definitive reason to play Splatoon. Combine everything we've talked about so far, and you've got a competitive multiplayer game with a real significant substance to it. And from Nintendo, no less. But say that's not your scene. You like Turf War well enough, but don't think you're good enough for ranked, want to get some practice in before you jump online for the first time, or just enjoy a single player story mode. Splatoon has you covered there too, with a brief but enjoyable story mode filled with Super Mario Galaxy-esque gauntlets that test your shooting and movement chops and five unique boss fights, all designed to get you used to the basics of the game and teach concepts that may be overlooked in the frantic action of online play. On top of that, there are collectibles in each level to test your exploration skills and let you learn more about the world of Splatoon. Between this, the expansive multiplayer experience, and the overflowing style and charm in its presentation, it's no wonder Splatoon instantly hooked those who played it. So how did Nintendo bring Splatoon to a new audience while also attracting the diehard fans of the original game? To put it simply, a whole bunch of refinement and polish. From the moment you start up Splatoon 2, there's a clear aesthetic upgrade. From the animations and the character selection screen to the stylized beginning of the tutorial, you can see the significantly improved presentation and lighting used throughout the game. The improved presentation carries over to all facets of the game, improving on the original stylized visuals and presentation while keeping true to what made it so unique. Presentation and clarity seem to be key areas of focus for Splatoon 2's development, as a lot of subtle design elements were created or altered to enhance the player experience, many of which have been executed so well the average returning player might not even notice them. First and foremost, the way that teams are displayed at the start of a match was changed. It's a simple change of camera angle and better animations on the Inklings themselves, but compare 1's entry animations to 2's, and you'll immediately notice the improvement in readability. Every weapon a player is carrying is instantly identifiable, priming players before the match even begins on what to expect for the enemy team. Once you get into a match, take a look at the HUD at the top center of the screen. Like the first game, it displays all 8 players in the match and whether they're alive or not. Unlike the first game, the HUD in 2 pulls the timer out of the upper left corner and puts it dead center for easier readability, along with displaying each player's weapon and whether or not their special is charged. The HUD also properly displays disconnects. Any player who's disconnected displays with a full color weapon icon on top of a death symbol, more easily alerting both teams to the fact that the match is down a player. 
there's a few other minor gameplay tweaks that lead to a better overall experience. The ink tank that displays while submerged now has a line in addition to the sound effect and light on the top to let you know exactly when you have enough ink to deploy a subweapon. Callouts have also been changed between games. The ambiguous command from the first game has been switched with the much clearer this way command, which is changed to ouch on death. These are relatively small changes, but effective signaling can mean the difference between a team wipe in the enemy's favor and a team wipe in your favor. Icons are still displayed on the field every time you splat an opponent, but assists also get icons this time around, communicating more information to you and your teammates about how the match is progressing. To compensate for the lack of an extra screen for a map, you can bring up the map with the X button and can super jump to teammates and beacons by moving the cursor and using the D-pad. Though it's harder to jump to an ally on a whim, having the whole map on a high resolution display significantly improves the readability and approximates the gamepad experience surprisingly well. Finally, the much requested ability to change your weapon and gear in between matches without backing out entirely was implemented, making playing casual matches with friends much easier this time around. Of course, it wouldn't be a sequel without new features, and Splatoon 2 has plenty to offer. Every main weapon from the first game returns, with a few new weapons in each class, plus two new weapon classes. Dooley's Umbrellas. Dooley's are dual pistols that give the user a dodge roll to replace their jump. While umbrellas are akin to shotguns, they deploy a shield when held, which can be launched to provide a mobile protective barrier. Rollers and chargers got significant upgrades as well. Rollers now have a vertical flick when jumping, pick up speed gradually and roll much faster than previous games, and can now roll over grates at full speed. Chargers, to compensate for this game's overall reduction in weapon range, now pierce through multiple enemies more easily, and non-scopes chargers are given the valuable option to store their charge while swimming for a brief amount of time, giving skilled players a reason to pick them over their scoped variants. Some of the first game's subweapons have been changed or removed. Splat bombs, suction bombs, and burst bombs return and function identically. Seekers were split into curling bombs and auto bombs, with curling bombs creating a path of ink behind them and bouncing off walls, while auto bombs pursue nearby opponents but leave no trail. Point sensors now linger for about 3 seconds, and ink mines now have a tracking function and can be placed multiple times in exchange for a weaker, quicker explosion. Disruptors became Toxic Mist, which isn't as debilitating, but can deny choke points much easier for a longer amount of time. Sprinklers now start off much stronger but weaken over time, rewarding frequent replacement and giving short-lived ones a greater impact. Splash walls can be instantly replaced in exchange for doing less damage and being less effective in tower control. Beacons, to compensate for being more difficult to use on a whim, can now be used twice by your allies and track enemies around them. There's also the new Fizzy Bomb, which can be charged by motion and detonates up to three times on a full charge, along with the Torpedo, which travels through the air to get to its opponent but can be shot down, typically acting as a distraction. In terms of special weapons, only one returns from the original game, and although they fulfill similar roles, are still bombastic, and can still turn the tide of battle, they're all significantly toned down. These include the Bomb Launcher, which acts like one's bomb rush, but uses a different bomb type from your sub-weapon, and can be held down to launch them farther at the cost of not launching as many. Ink Armor, which gives you and your team a shield that protects you from one or two hits, but makes you more visible. Tenta Missiles, which let you lock onto opponents and fire a small volley of missiles their way. The Stingray, which pierces through obstacles but leaves you nearly immobile. The Ink Jet, a jetpack that fires large shots that instantly splat opponents. The Splashdown, which forces you into the air and creates a small explosion when you land, eliminating obstacles below and damaging enemy specials. The Ink Storm, which makes a slow moving rain cloud for area denial. The Baller, which gives you a hamster ball that paints turf as you move and can be detonated on command. The Bubble Blower, which creates three large paint bubbles that can be used as shields and inflict massive damage once popped. The Booyah Bomb, which charges from you and your teammates' booyah signals and can be thrown a short distance away to create a large torrent of ink. And the Ultra Stamp, a giant hammer that makes you nearly invincible from the front but vulnerable from the back, and can be thrown at enemies for an instant splat. While similar to the original specials, these specials have significant weaknesses. No special makes you invulnerable, and all of them can be shot down, destroyed, or avoided. In turn, however, this rewards skilled play, and makes special management even more important from a strategic standpoint than in the first game. 
With new sub and special weapons, each weapon now has a different kit. Some similar to their original kits, and others very different. All the new additions make for a ton of variety, which has been facilitated by regular balance patches to shake up the metagame on a larger scale than in Splatoon 1. Gear abilities make a return as well, remaining mostly the same in function with some being altered for balance reasons. Like before, you can purchase gear in shops and from other players, and can upgrade the number of slots on any piece of gear. But this time around, there have been a few additions that improve the system substantially. Your gear inventory is easier to sort through, allowing you to sort weapons by sub, special, or main weapon type, and gear by ability or brand. Using Nintendo's much derided mobile app, you can order gear with different main abilities. With any piece of gear being able to access almost any ability in the game, this opens up much more aesthetic variation and customization options for dedicated players. Meal tickets, rewards for playing in the new Salmon Run mode, can be used to give you more control over what random sub-abilities you get, as well as give you a cash or experience boost. By far the best addition, however, is the ability to scrub out sub-abilities you don't want and turn them into ability chunks, which you can use to completely customize the sub-abilities on any piece of gear, allowing complete control over your loadout that was next to impossible in Splatoon 1. Map rotations in Splatoon 2 have changed slightly as well. They're on two hour rotations now instead of four, and don't drag you back to the news feed every time. The new rotation hours still allow for the weapon and stage coordination of one, while simultaneously giving players less time to wait if they want to play in a certain stage or game mode. Splatoon 2 touts new stages as well as some returning stages. And apart from the completely identical walleye warehouse, every returning stage is slightly altered. There are more stages to pull from this time around. 23 versus 16, and stages are about 15% larger on average. Stages are more balanced this time around, with narrow stages like Port Mackerel being significantly expanded, and more general breathing room being available this time around. Some stages that were banned from rotation in Splatoon 1, like Black Belly Skate Park's hilariously quick Rainmaker layout, were fixed to be more fair for the defending team. Speaking of ranked, it's seen its fair share of overhauls as well. While the fundamentals of the three modes remain intact, there have been some quality of life improvements to the overall experience as well as to each returning game mode. Ranked progression still uses the letter grade system, but now goes from C- to X, with 9 S plus ranks in between. Unlike Splatoon 1, your ranks are now separate between game modes. No more getting to the top of the ladder by only playing splat zones and ignoring everything else. Instead of being ranked on a number scale, your rank progression is represented by a meter which fills up when you win and starts to crack as you lose. Fortunately, unlike the first game, you're not punished whenever a player on your team disconnects. You can even jump multiple ranks at once, quickly getting skilled players back to players of their skill level. Although it's more forgiving than in the first game, the system works such that you'll more often than not end up playing with players who are on the same skill level as you. Playing ranked with friends has seen an overhaul as well. Requiring both of you to be at least B- in one game mode, you are pitted against other groups in a separate rotation pool from regular ranked play, and compete against everyone else playing league battles at that time slot. After the rotation ends, you can see how you fared versus everyone else who played that rotation with you. The old ranked modes have seen some changes as well. Splat Zones now display zone coverage in the top of the screen, allowing you to see at a glance how much of each zone is filled by what team. Tower Control's eponymous tower has seen some changes. It no longer speeds up when multiple players are on top of it, except when it's in the new checkpoint spots which delay the tower until they're cleared. The Rainmaker no longer fires tornadoes, instead firing mortar rounds that create large explosions when fully charged that stick to whatever they're fired at, along with disappearing if the shield is popped and the weapon is not picked up. On top of this, there's a new ranked mode called Clam Blitz in which you collect clams scattered throughout the map and assemble 10 into power clams to throw into the enemy's goal. Like the other ranked modes, it highly rewards strategic play and teamwork. Some argue more than the other ranked modes. With all these improvements in mind, it's not hard to see why ranked continues to be many players' primary reason to play Splatoon, and why the game has developed a competitive scene that continues to be fostered by Nintendo, with their official Splatoon 2 World Championship tournaments every year. Splatoon's development team seems to be more in touch with its player base and gives more player freedom that other Nintendo games don't usually see. 
regularly releasing balance patches that make small shifts to the meta, and going as far as to embrace player-discovered elements of the game's movement mechanics like sub-strafing and quick ledge climbing, instead of Nintendo's usual philosophy of removing technical elements in future installments of their games. As if all of that wasn't enough, Splatoon 2 also introduces Salmon Run, a horde mode that puts you and three other players against three waves of salmonids at a time, and tasks you with collecting golden eggs the boss salmonids hold. These bosses tend to mimic special weapons in function. Stingers to stingrays, flyfish to tenta missiles, and drizzlers to ink storms, to name a few one-to-one -one examples. This makes some good practice for countering those specials in normal matches. You're given a random weapon each wave from a set that differs every shift, and one of four special weapons to get yourself out of danger if the need arises. The mode can get quite hectic. It can be easy to get locked in if you mismanage your available terrain. It's quite thrilling though. It can be a great introduction to basic movement skills that can transfer over to regular matches, and mandatory weapons force the player to adapt to all kinds of weapons they might not have otherwise picked for themselves. As mentioned before, you even get rewards for doing well in the mode, ranging from cash to gear to meal tickets, incentivizing players who primarily play PvP modes to jump in every now and then to score some bonuses. There's many players who even prefer Salmon Run to the main game, so there's sure to be no shortage of players every time a rotation comes on. If you were curious about Splatoon 2's single player offerings, you're in for a treat. Splatoon 2's story mode continues to expand on the series' lore through optional collectibles and radio chatter like the first game. On top of providing a tougher series of levels overall that covers every weapon type in the game, giving more opportunities to practice every weapon type in a safe environment and rewarding those dedicated enough to beat every level with a particular weapon type, a skin that can be used in multiplayer. If that's not enough for you and you want a more challenging campaign, there's also the Octo Expansion, a full $20 campaign with over 80 levels that are significantly tougher than anything one or two's main story throws at you. Although by and large an improvement on the first game in nearly every way, there are still a few areas where Splatoon 2 falters a bit. The news intro when you launch the game or rotate into a salmon run shift is still unskippable and now takes even longer to complete. Money is now less valuable overall since you can no longer use it to purchase slots or rerolls like in the first game. There's still only one game mode per rotation, and while the blow is softened by the 2 hour rotation speed, it's still feasible that you could go a few days without seeing your favorite ranked rotation in play at all. For all I've praised its multiplayer system, Splatoon 2 still doesn't have a proper party system, forcing you to hop into a friend's game and hope a slot opens up so that you get the chance to play. Unlike the first game, there's also no local player single console multiplayer in Splatoon 2 at all. Although given that Splatoon 1's Battle Dojo was a severely limited alternative game mode that didn't relate to any of the big modes in the game, and led to situations like this... You could argue that its omission is actually a good thing. All in all, however, these are small blemishes on an otherwise fantastic overall package, and one of the most innovative and enjoyable shooters on the market on any platform. Thank you for sticking through this whole video. I can only hope that I've convinced at least someone who is on the fence about playing either of the Splatoon games to give them a shot, and that if you're already a Splatoon veteran that you either learned something new or found it entertaining. I didn't mention music in my review as it's difficult to tackle a soundtrack as wildly varied as this one, but it's been playing in the background throughout the video and I absolutely love it. If you want to see someone take a deeper look into it than I could ever dream of doing, check out Scruffy's excellent video exploring the composition of the last minute track, which I will link to in the video description. I also didn't cover Splatfests on account of the final one taking place when this video was in its final stages. But given how 1's final Splatfest shaped the story of 2, I'm excited to see how 2's final Splatfest will shape the story of 3. Thank you once again for watching, and until next time, I'm Forma, and those are my thoughts.